the book of Ecclesiastes. And this is a new sermon series that we're beginning um, that will take over the month of October. And I am really excited about it because I love Ecclesiastes. So with that being said, um, hear the word of the Lord. These are the words of the quester, David's son and king in Jerusalem. Smoke, nothing but smoke. That's what the quester says. There's nothing to anything. It's all smoke. What's there to show for a lifetime of work? A lifetime of working your fingers to the bone. One generation goes its way, the next arrives, but nothing changes. It's business as usual for old planet Earth. The sun comes up and the sun goes down. Then it does it again and again, the same old round. The wind blows south, the wind blows north. Around and around and around it blows, blowing this way, then that, the whirling erratic wind. All the rivers flow into the sea, but the sea never fills up. The rivers keep flowing to the same old place and then start all over and do it again. Everything's boring, utterly boring. No one can find any meaning in it. Boring to the eye, boring to the ear. What was will be again. What happened will happen again. There's nothing new on this earth. Year after year, it's the same old thing. Does someone call out, hey, this is new? Don't get excited. It's the same old story. Nobody remembers what happened yesterday. And the things that will happen tomorrow... Nobody will remember them either. Don't count on being remembered. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Boy. What's this stuff doing up here? I got work to do. It's nonstop. Oh, that's my day. Ah. Split wood, stack the wood, split the 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 wood, all day long, that's all I do. Split the wood, stack the wood, all right, Ted, split the wood, stack the wood. Yeah, what? never ends, man. You guys just keep bringing me more logs. I'm just st- split the wood. Stack the wood. Split the wood. That's all you're telling me to do all day long. And here, two more logs. This job's never gonna end. Oh. What? Those are the two you dropped. I only gave you a wheelbarrow. Oh, man. I'm telling you. When is this job ever gonna end? Watch the Steeler game. We'll keep you abreast of what the score is, all right? What? You are as- Oh, okay. See you later. Dad, nab it. Can't believe it. Split the wood. Stack the wood. Ah. Dang. Maybe Macbeth was right. Oh, that's all I could think. Life is just a passing shadow. Oh, it's a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Ha! It's a tale told by an idiot. It's full of sound and fury. And, but... Uh, Amounts to nothing. Nothing. Same old, same old. Round and around and around and around. Again and again. Split the wood. Do the work. Again, again. Do it again. Wow. You know, Victor Frankl has noticed that, that there's this whole new neuroses that exists in the world today. The neuroses that people have about 
going and running to their psychiatrist because they just can't take it anymore. And they're laying out on these couches and they're just pouring their souls out and saying, life is just meaningless. It's nothing. What am I here for? You know, it's, it's kind of funny. Because they even think about it, you know, here's George Carlin looks at it from this perspective and he says, you know, it's sort of like dusting. That's what life is. It's like dusting. Here we are. It's our attempt to try and make things right, try and make them nice and clean and new. But in the very act of dusting, what are we doing? We're securing our job for the next dusting. <laughs> oh, will it ever end? It just keeps coming. One thing, ding, da ding, da ding, da ding. And I look at the book of Ecclesiastes. And I look at that and I think, wow. You know King Solomon? What's he got going on there? It's absolutely right. It's nothing but smoke. It's vanity of vanities, man. It's just a mist. It's totally worthless. You look at life, you get up, you go eat your breakfast, you brush your teeth, you get on the school bus, you go to school, you sit in class, you get off the school bus, you come home, you do your homework, you go to bed, you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you eat your breakfast, you get in your car, you drive to work, you fight the traffic, you sit behind your desk, you do your little thing, you get back in the car, you drive back up 28, cursing and swearing all Away. You go back home, eat your dinner, sit and watch TV, go to bed, wake up the next morning, eat your breakfast, brush your teeth. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, this is a good thing. Life. <laughs> Do it all. What's it for? Nothing. It's meaningless. But you know what? As King Solomon is looking out over the world, he looks and he sees all of this. He's like that guy at Kennywood that sits on the bench and watches people walk by. Or he's like that person, maybe you're one of those people that go to the mall and you just love watching people. And he's just observing and he's putting it all together. And he's recognizing as he's putting it all together that the people who don't know God live in this kind of paradigm. This is the way their lives are. You know, Ecclesiastes, he's the, he's the preacher, he's the teacher, he's the koholeth. That's the one that says he's the one who gathers people together to teach them. Because Ecclesiastes, that's from that Greek word ecclesia, which means church or the called people. And we are the called people. And so we recognize that there is something a little bit more than just the monotony of life. And so what is it that King Solomon does as he's writing this and compiling this? He's making an observation about how people are. What the bulk of the world, how they respond. Be honest. You go to work? You go to school? You go up to somebody and you say, hey, how are things going? Same old, same old. Or they'll say, oh, SOS, and we all know what that means, but I'm not going to say it here in this company. That's what people will say. That's what they'll do. A sense of real kind of futility. Mark Twain captured it pretty well in his quote. And this is, he's saying, hopefully it's going to get there. Come on, Mark. Where are you? I know you're there. There you are. <laughs> Mark Twain. 
kind of taking King Solomon's words and putting it into his own language. He writes this. He says, a myriad of men are born. They labor and sweat and struggle. They squabble and scold and fight. They scramble for little mean advantages over each other. Age creeps upon them. Infirmities follow. Those they love are taken from them. And the joy of life is turned into aching grief. It, the release, comes at last. The only unpoisoned gift earth ever had for them. And they vanished from a world where they were of no consequence. A world which will lament them a day and forget them forever. This is how people think. This is the world in which we live. And it's interesting that King Solomon takes this because what is he trying to do? He is engaging the society and the world and the culture around him and he takes that predominant mindset that exists in the world and we know that here's myriads. I mean, this is millennia of thought process going on here. It hasn't changed. People today still think this exact same way. And he takes that thought process and he puts it out there for the people to read. And they're going, wow, this king gets it. He knows it. Yeah. What's the meaning of life anyway? Here we are. It's Sunday school, the very first day of Sunday school. It's the first day of the year for us in a lot of ways. In the church year, our program year is launching. And here we're kicking off with such a passage as this. Oh, what's going on with the world? You know, this is so hopeless. But the reality is we who are the called ones should be alert to what is the fact that surrounds us. And we need to know how to be able to engage the people around us and where they're coming from and not to recognize ourselves in our own little bubble, but to be able to step outside and say, oh yes, this is how people are thinking. I know where they're coming from because we know that there are so many people who are drifting away from church. And here we are today gathered in this space to worship because we know that there is meaning to life because Christ has come as the author of life and he gives us that hope, that strength, that purpose. And so we gather here to make declaration of praise and thanksgiving for that. And so King Solomon likewise knows that. But he's pulling out this prologue to be able to give to the people, to draw them in and say, yes, I understand what it is that the bulk of the world recognizes. You see, it's so easy for us to get swallowed up into the meaninglessness of what our days are. Get up, go to work, come to bed. Get up, go to work, come to bed. You know, G.K. Chesterton put it this way. It's kind of fun. And this is how we as Christians should understand this. Even as we recognize what seems to be the monotony of life. What seems to be some kind of meaningless existence. G.K. Chesterton puts it this way and he says, you know, here's how it is. He says, God is like that infant child. Now, any of you here are either an uncle or a cousin, an older brother maybe, or an older sister maybe. You're a grandparent. You're something in which you have the opportunity to engage with a younger child. And when that younger child comes running up to you for that very first time, what is it that goes across your mind? I want to do something for this child that will entertain them. All right? To draw them, to catch their attention, to be able to give them a spark, to be excited about their encounter with me. 
That's what we do as adults. That's what we think or I hope that we do. So that when the child runs up to you, you say, oh, come on up here. You know, and there's grandma. Come on. you. And she crosses her legs and puts the child on her foot and goes, this is how the old man rides. Um, but, um, but, um, but, um. And the little kid is riding on your knee. And all of a sudden, it's laughing and giggling. And when you're done doing it, the little kid looks at you and says, oh, do that again. Or you go up to that child and you say, hey, look at this, man. And you pull a quarter out of his ear. And he's like, oh, hey, do that again. And I'm like, okay. And you go up and pull a quarter out of his ear again. Oh, do that again. Or maybe worse yet, you know, here's the one, this is the one I used to do all the time with Caleb and any other little kid that comes by. You pick them up and you wing them up into the air and they're laughing and giggling and their eyes are sparkling and it's just the joy of life is bubbling out of them and they come crashing down into your arms and you swing them between your legs and you throw them back up again and then you catch them and then they look at you and say, do that again. And you're like, oh, Okay, he throw them up. And after like five times, they're still going, do that again. He's like, oh, okay, let's try something new. Why don't you say we try something different now? And they're all the more ready to keep doing the same thing. This is what G.K. Chisterson says, that God is like that child. Do that again, do that again. You see, we as adults grow weary of doing things again and again. Because we think we must always do something new. But there's nothing new under the sun. And that's not to say I'm going to put a huge kibosh or squelch upon creativity. That's not it at all. It's about recognizing the joy and the celebration of the established patterns and rhythm that God has placed into the world. You see, as God looks out into the world, what does he do? He sees this, this, this beautiful daisy pop up out of the ground. And guess what that daisy does? Year in and year out, the exact same flower with the white petal, petals and the beautiful yellow center. And God looks at that daisy and says, do that again. And up it comes out of the ground again. And God looks, do that again. And then this giant oak tree comes up out of the ground, the same as it's been doing for a million years. And God says, oh, do that again. He loves that. And a child gestates in the womb and is born after nine months and comes to life. And God looks at that child, oh, do that again. This is the beauty of God's created order. And it happens in this wonderful creative cycle of life in the rhythm of the day that God has season after season. And now we come into fall and this is a beautiful season. And God looks out there with a sparkle in his eye and a giggle and a deep laughter and says, oh, do that again. It's not monotonous. It's only for us adults who fail to recognize the beauty of God's rhythm that we grow weary and we're not strong enough to understand the essence of monotony. <laughs> That's what Chesterton would say. You see, so for ourselves, as the sun rises and sets and the moon rises and sets, and the rivers continue to flow into the sea and it never fills and the streams continue to fill and it goes again and again and again and again. This is all part of God's design. And so for us, what does this mean for us as we step out into the world and encounter those who feel like well, life is just this endless cycle of futility? We are not in a pagan world that recognizes that this is a, a cyclical trap. But we are the Christians, the called ones who understand who God has called us to be. And each day, as our grandmothers used to tell us, or maybe it was our mom or some other person of significance in our lives, used to come up to us and say, each day is a treasure of the Lord. And you're like, yes. 
That's right. So that when you get in your car and you drive off to work and you fight that same traffic and you sit behind that same desk and you finish the day and you get back in your car and you drive back home and maybe you veer and go off another way, but it's still basically the same way. And you come back home and you have dinner and you sit on a couch and enjoy your family and go to bed and get up the next day, brush your teeth, take a shower, do those routines. It's that opportunity that you have to be at that little child. Oh, Lord, do that again. For I have another day to be able to glorify you with the things that are part of my life, with the talents and skills that you have given to me that establishes for me a rhythm to my day. So that as I'm preparing the children's lunches for school, as I'm getting them ready, and, and it becomes an exasperation because, yes, you're going to continue as a parent to say, did you do your homework? Did you brush your teeth? Did you make your bed? That's part of your season. That's part of your rhythm. And not to get exasperated by that, even as exasperating as it is. Your life is not meaningless. We're not part of a rat race, my friends. For God takes pleasure in the human race. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you so very much for this glorious day and for the rhythms and patterns of life in which you look out over the world and you say, do that again. And so likewise for us, may we have that same childlike innocence that each thing that we do and each opportunity that we have to live would be the same reply to saying, oh, do that again. That we have a recognize another opportunity to glorify you and that which you have placed before us. That each day is a good thing and that life is not just a walking shadow and that our days are just a tale told by an idiot but our days are filled with joy because you are the greatest storyteller of all and your wisdom goes beyond anything we could comprehend it's in your son's precious and holy name we pray amen <laughs>